It is also my honor to introduce uh, this year's Spitz Lecture, and it is um, our, um, our tradition to read a portion of the uh, letter from Armand Spitz to the president at that time, uh, 1967, Vondel Chamberlain. Um, so Armand Spitz says to the president, you may have heard me say many times that in my opinion, the full potential of the planetarium, and I use the word in its broadest possible connotation, has yet barely been scratched. It is my earnest hope that the people who are chosen to be Armand Spitz lecturers will be selected because of the fact that they, they have creative imaginations in this field and the courage to visualize the achievement of ideals in a practical way by the use of the planetarium instrument. In your selection of speakers, choose those who are not ashamed to acknowledge that they have a dream. I know we won't be disappointed. Tonight's Armand Spitz, Spitz lecturer um, David Batch, Dr. David Batch, I should probably say, uh, joined the staff of Abrams uh, in 1968. Uh, he became a director here in 1983 and retired here in 2013. He held the offices of Secretary Treasurer uh, and President of the Association. He was a charter member of the International Planetarium Society. Um, and Dave will share with us tonight, Life Among the Stars. David Batch. Thank you. I need my hands, so I need to know this is going to work. How's the sound there? Great. Okay, yes. Uh, age uh, requires me to read. <laughs> so uh, that's what I'm doing back here. Um, I, I make sure you, you folks know I've been given up to an hour <laughs> to offer my thoughts and perspective. But I know how this works. You've been here for uh, about two days, jam-packed, starts early, ends late. Most civilized conferences end each day at the evening meal. <laughs> no, GLPA has to make sure you get your money's worth. <laughs> um, so uh, I... Uh, Know the hospitality suite follows, and we'll keep that in mind. I understand that some of you might lose focus. That's okay. I've been in those, those shoes. <laughs> uh, remember, those who do, that the proceedings will be available. So uh, let's get started. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's actually a thrill to be at this, with this group again. Uh, feels like I never left, actually. Wonderful to see all the new faces as well. It's uh, a little humbling, actually, to be asked to honor the name of Armand Spitz. His enthusiasm for and dedication to promoting astronomy to the masses was unparalleled in his time. When I see the planetariums today and the multitude of educational activities associated with planetariums, I can't help but wonder, what would Armand think? How could he not be proud? For newer members who might not be familiar with Armand Spitz, you can find a particularly good overview of his life written by Brent Abatan Tuono uh, as part of a master's thesis and printed in the March 1995 IPS Planetarium. It's freely available on the web as well. I think you might enjoy taking a look at that. The uh, Planetarian article opens with a quote from Armand. It says a great deal about the man, I think, and is pertinent to the occasion, so I'm going to read it to you. 
I never expected to make any substantial contribution to astronomy or science, but what greater satisfaction can I have than to have one very famous astronomer tell me that he gained his first interest in astronomy through viewing a Spitz planetarium when he was a small boy. I can only hope that in whatever celestial bookkeeping there is, I will be given indirect credit for helping along the knowledge of the heavens. And I find that a state, this is unquote, I find that a statement to which we all can aspire. It also sets a nice tone for the talk, so. Right off, I should confess that I was previously asked to be a Spitz lecturer, but at the time I felt I didn't possess the credentials needed to do the job. My vision of the ideal lecturer was someone who had a history of accomplish, accomplishments in the uh, profession, an elder statesman or stateswoman, if you will. Well, now I'm here. <laughs> I possess half of the requirements I deem necessary. I am elder. <laughs> uh, I'll attempt to wing the statesman part of it. One advantage I found, it is true what they say about growing older. I have become more philosophical, reflective with the years. First, I, I must say how impressed I am with GLPA. As a professional organization, it's a wonder to behold. It's fantastic. I knew this before, but seeing, seeing again tonight what goes on uh, is, is amazing to me. The number and quality of resources and activities available are remarkable, both for those who attend the conferences and state meetings and those who are unable. And the camaraderie is inspirational. And all of this is run by volunteers, most of whom have taxing full-time jobs, as you all know. The kind of effort put forth by this group can only occur through a deep passion for the, and strong belief in what the group is doing. I say thank you for all I have received over the years. Being a part of GLPA has enriched my professional life in many ways. And I mean that sincerely. I've come to think of GLPA as a family and these gatherings as large family reunions, as many of us do. To me, the comparisons between family reunion and GLPA conference are curious. For instance, no matter how infrequently we may contact each other or between conferences, there's an immediate affinity for each other, whether, uh, whether longtime friends or new acquaintances. It's like we share DNA. It's also the place to exchange the latest news and gossip. <laughs> There's even people at conferences who take on roles associated with families. For example, what family would be complete without a crazy uncle? <laughs> I think we all agree that we have those in GLPA. You know who you are. <laughs> I've always been amazed at how quick members are willing to help out whether it's sharing a new technique or loaning a piece of equipment as examples. No jealousy, no competition in this family. A word to newcomers, in case you haven't discovered already, don't hesitate to jump right in and partake. Ask questions or advice, and don't overlook the social hours, better known as hospitality suites. In some groups seem like clicks to you, they aren't. Go introduce yourself. I know we uh, get in groups that we like so much and haven't seen people in a while, but very welcoming. OK, enough of the family analog analogy. Let me just say you should be extremely proud of this organization, Grand Great Lakes Planetarium Association. I'd like to cite a personal example of GP GLPA's value. The first GLPA conference I attended was the second one ever held. Um, I missed uh, being a founding member by one meeting. 
but I actually had no idea about that at the time. It convened in Cincinnati in 1966. I know what you must be thinking. He doesn't look that old, right? <laughs> Ralph Ewers was the director there, as well as our conference host. At that time, I was a senior in college. I was an astronomy TA. My college had installed a, a planetarium, a Spitz AP3, the previous year. I had learned the bare rudiments of how to use it. My astronomy professor invited me and another student to attend the conference with him because he thought it would benefit, or we would benefit from the exposure to GLPA. Clearly, he was right in my case. There, I was captivated by the almost magical quality of the planetarium demos I saw and the impressive creativity of the people who presented them. It's also there that I first grasped the understanding that people got paid to do this. <laughs> Planetum airing <laughs> Planetarium Ing <laughs> was a real, honest to goodness profession, a career. And a bunch of years later, here I am. <laughs> okay, move on. Another Armin Spitz quote makes a nice introduction to my next topic. I uh, uh, quote I am not a mathematical astronomer, I don't get along with mathematical equations, I am not very much of a scientist. You can call me an interpreter of science if you want. Remember the phrase, interpreter of science. Early in my career, I had the good fortune to be part of a project to bring astronomy to the national parks. It will come as no surprise to many of you that Von Del Chamberlain was the uh, principal investigator on the grant. I like to think Von Del started the movement that is now common within the parks but I'll allow for the possibility that other people, some here in fact, uh, independently saw the value of using the night skies in the parks for public astronomy. Although that experience, uh, I mean, sorry, through that experience, I became acquainted with a number of naturalists. Most people call them rangers. They tend to call themselves interpreters and they're uh, interactions with the visitors, interpretation. That was a new idea to me at that time. I also learned about their thinking regarding the presentations they make to the visitors and then th realized there is much in common between what they do and what we undertake in planetariums. At that time, the National Park Service, the philosophy for naturalist interpreters, as often they were called, was summarized in a book entitled Interpreting Our Heritage by uh, the author was Freeman Tilden. It's no longer in print, but freely available on the web. Just for, search for the title if you're interested. For this talk, I dug out my old dog-eared copy and looked at my underlinings for nuggets of wisdom to share. In the margin of one of the pages, I found a note I had written to myself. It said, I am an astronomy interpreter. That reinforced my intent to tell you about the book. Um, so here are Friedman Tilden's six principles of interpretation. Number one, an interpretation does not somehow, uh, that does not somehow relate to what is being displayed or described to something within the personality or experience of the visitor is sterile. Two, information as such is not interpretation. Interpretation is revelation based upon information. Three, interpretation is an art which combines many arts, whether the, material, whether the materials presented are scientific, historic, architectural. Four, the chief claim of inter interpretation is not instruction, it's provocation. Five, interpretation should aim to present a whole rather than a part and must address itself to the whole person rather than any phase. Six, 
Interpretations addressed to children should not be diluted or presented to adults, but should follow a fundamental different, fundamentally different approach. That one we know about for some time, I think. So we are astronomy interpreters. A few more tidbit, uh, tidbits from the, uh, the book. Uh, this quote comes from Anatole France, a French poet novelist who wrote, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1922. He says, do not try to satisfy your vanity by teaching a great many things. Awaken people's curiosity. It is enough to open minds, not to overload them. Put there just a spark. There is, if there is some good flammable stuff, it will catch fire. <laughs> uh, my comment on that is, the number one fault I see in myself, particularly in the early days, and others in this trade, is presenting too many facts, too much material. It's a tendency, natural tendency, of course. Uh, when we are passionate about a subject, we want to share it with others and figure if we can just give them enough information they will begin to like it too. Okay, another quote from the book. The most common error derives from the fact that the writer has in mind the question, what do I wish to say? It is of no importance whatever. <laughs> the important thing is what does the audience wish to hear? Another, education is knowledge treated imaginatively. I had to think about the word imaginatively uh, in this age of alternate truths. <laughs> the, to me, the point is acquiring information in the planetarium setting should always be a pleasant experience at minimum. Another, another one. It is elementary that partici participation in our programming must be physical. The writer, I think, was referring to programs in historical parks. But I think firmly and firmly believe there should be physical component to planetarium activities whenever possible. I always considered the planetarium as a means to an end, the end being for the visitors to physically connect with the real nighttime sky. We at Abrams would try to provide that opportunity, as I know a lot of you do, with outdoor observing using naked eye, binoculars, telescopes, whenever possible. I still vividly remember my first view of Saturn through a friend's telescope. I was 11 years old, years old at the time. To me, that's a powerful statement for the physical aspect. Uh, another one, cultivate, cultivate the power that lies in understatement. Somewhat related to this, I used to wonder if we, Abrams, and other planetariums oversell astronomical events with ex exclamations like, it's the closest full moon in five centuries, <laughs> which may be technically true, but to the public not noticeably different than next month's full moon. Uh, okay, another, whatever is delivered without enthusiasm will be received without interest. That's enough to give you the flavor. If you're interested, download a copy of the book, browse it on your own. I was pleased to notice recently that IPS is forming a working group for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Is that so? Um, I also spotted a, a session at this conference, maybe, that was exploring some of the same things? Yes? Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> I'm glad to see the subject getting a formal treatment. Who let this guy in, anyway? <laughs> Oh, that's right, he's the crazy uncle one. <laughs> um, 
Let's see, where am I? <laughs> I'm glad to see the subject getting a formal treatment in our profession. I also see the importance of each of us continually examining, examining the issue on a personal basis. I admit being a bit late to this realization. I blame it on living in this liberal bubble known as East Lansing. <laughs> I always tried to be sensitive to issues of diversity, but mostly I was naive. The notion of white privilege woke me up. Upon first encountering this viewpoint, I found myself defensive. An odd feeling, I thought, for someone who supports diversity. And then I read an analogy that mixed bicycle riding and white privilege. I enjoy bike riding, but seldom do so on a busy, uh, busy streets. It's just too dangerous. I've long thought the laws equating bicycles to cars are poor unrealistic. In my opinion, every busy street should have a dedicated bike lane with a physical bearer between the car and the bike. <laughs> uh, the gist of the analogy is that bikes have to ride on a system designed for cars, which means drivers take for granted that the system is theirs. A natural assumption, really, particularly if you don't ride a bike. The bikes are likely considered interlopers, consciously or unconsciously. Further, the system allows drivers to intimidate and hassle the bikers without them, that is, the drivers, ever knowing or being aware they are doing it. Not giving the bike enough space, for example, or not paying attention to bike presence when turning. Since I'm both a rider and a driver, the experience really hit home. White people operate in a system designed by them and largely for them without realizing it. The system would naturally allow unintended harassment of non-whites without whites having a clue. That's where I was. That was a powerful recognition to me. Understand also that this reasoning applies to gender issues, disabled, and so forth, essentially any majority minority situation. That realize, realization led me to the concept of unconscious bias. The key word here is unconscious. Jennifer Eberhard, a sociology professor from Stanford, produced some of the early groundbreaking research on unconscious bias. In one experiment, she had students look at a screen and see how quickly they could identify various images that so slowly came into focus. So they started fuzzy and by minute steps came into focus. Uh, let's see. One of the, ex oh, I read that. What the students didn't know is that they were first subliminally shown a burst of human faces. For one group, the faces were black, <coughs> the other white. For most images, the students were shown there, uh, that were shown there, uh, there was little difference in how quickly the two groups recognized the object. But when the object was a gun, the students who were exposed to the black faces identified the weapon significantly sooner. The important point for each of us uh, well, I should say, uh, much research now exists on the presence uh, and nature of unconscious or implicit bias. The effect is real. The important point for each of us is to, is to be aware that unconscious bias exists. It is a common human circumstance. It is not a deep moral fall, uh, failing which, that requires punishment. Instead, we should try to root it out in our selves and in our organizations and attempt to manage the consequences. The topic of biases and privileges led me to the concept of luck, for lack of a better term. Uh, perhaps my least favorite expression is self-made man. 
or woman or person, but almost always man. I cringe whenever I hear or read it. There is no such person. I find the notion egotistical at least and certainly delusional. It is fine to celebrate an important accomplishment, but to imply it was solely through the efforts of one individual is completely to, demit, to dismiss anyone else's efforts or influence and what I call the notion of luck. To be clear, I don't mean hocus pocus, supernatural luck. Uh, the definition I'm, I'm using is it's a chance event not brought on by the individual's action. If each of us took a t uh, the time to examine in some de detail how we got to where we are, we'd find luck played a significant role. Since I've been retired, I've had time to reflect, and I traced my planetarium path. Allow me to briefly elaborate, and I hope that it might prod you to think about your own situation. I was born in a democratic country, luck, to a middle-class mother and father who were supportive and loving, luck. I was a child at an impressionable age near the beginning of the space age. I'll just pause, not say luck every time. As a teenager, I witnessed the launch of Sputnik and the early space race. I was able to attend college. The college I chose installed a planetarium. I was picked to be an astronomy lab assistant. My astronomy instructor was, and still is, an accept acceptable teacher. Uh, I was taken to a GLPA conference when I was a student. While in grad school, my draft number came up. Before serving, I was hired into a job that allowed a teaching deferment. The job was in an outstanding planetarium with exceptional staff. You get the point. Each of you has, has your own random walk of luck, and every one of our trails ended, to this point, in a planetarium. To my way of thinking, that's an exceptional piece of good luck. I think an examination of luck is a powerful tool that would benefit anyone. I'd like to see it more widely used and discussed. We can all endure a little more humility. We are in trying times with relentless negativity and deep divisions. For most of us, it's an unsettling experience, a time of uncertainty time when it's easy to think the country, if not the world, is going to hell in the proverbial handbasket. Hand I admit to being caught up in this pessimism. I have been known to say the situation is so difficult and immense, it seems that a revolution may be required to recover. I was at least half serious. I'm not alone. Many polls have shown that people think the world is getting worse. And it's not just an American opinion. Most, most other people around the world believe the same. How do we get in this state? One theory suggests that the trend began with the Vietnam War and Watergate, when we as a country began to question our leaders, eventually spreading to the current state where everything is aggressively questioned. News report, reporting and social media is certainly one reason for this negativity. By its nature, news deals with the extraordinary, the exceptional, which is usually not the optimistic. The same goes for social media. Sensationalism is uh, more attention grabbing and more likely to be passed on without scrutiny. Or perhaps it's simply because in the early days of human evolution, to be fearful provided a better chance of survival. A less concerned approach more often resulted in death <coughs> and the loss of the genes to the gene pool. Psychologists offer a bit more. They have known for some time that people see their own lives more favorably than average. 
We think we are less likely to be divorced, get ill, be laid off, etc. But when asked about society as a whole, we are more pessimistic. <coughs> Psychologists also observe that what we can recall most easily from memory is what people believe will most likely occur. That's why the endless negativity on media has, uh, has such a perverse effect on society. The more, com uh, contem the more I contemplated, the more I focused on the notion of a revolution. I think my wife was beginning to worry about me. <laughs> then I realized that, indeed, we already are in the midst of a revolution, the digital revolution. I recall from the general circumstances um, of the Industrial Re Revolution from my high school history, um, and I remember that it was a time of general upheaval. People's lives changed dramatically in a couple of generations. But the, the key point that struck me was that the big picture, over time, was positive. Individuals were hurt, but civilization advanced. Would that pattern repeat our current revolution? I simplistically began to think there was hope. Then I happened to cross a TED talk uh, by a Harvard psychology professor, Steven Pinker. Some of you may know him, at least as I go on here. I'd run across his name before, but had, hadn't paid much attention. He's well known in the field of psycholinguistics, which means nothing to me. But he's also written a number of popular science books that have received acclaim. His latest book is entitled Enlightenment Now, and it's subtitled The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. Uh, incidentally, he's a fellow of the uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. I, I realize a number of you are familiar with that organization. How many are? Just for quick. Yeah, good. Um, but if you aren't, I highly recommend you look them up and consider subscribing to the Skeptical Inquirer or read it in the library. Uh, this is a note to myself, but these days I find myself more likely to read Skeptical Inquirer cover to cover than Sky and Telescope, which means quite a bit to me. Professor Pinker offers, Pinker offers a radically optimistic viewpoint. He insists that by almost any measure of human progress, the world is better than ever. And he wields the data to, sh to prove it. To counteract our negatively skewed thinking, Pinker says we merely need to pay attention to the numbers. And boy, does he mean numbers. His style of bulldozing you with facts may be overwhelming and off-putting to some, but he offers plenty of sources for confirmation online to view at your leisure. His three favorite websites will appear in the printed version of this talk in the proceeding, if anybody's interested in knowing that. And I do, uh, at minimum, suggest you take a look at his TED talk. See. Okay. On that, hap on that happier note, I moved on to the elephant in the room, so to speak. I'd feel amiss if I didn't bring it up the topic. I refer to the so-called war on science. It's part of a large, larger threat to change the way we think about truth, primarily for political reasons, as I see it. How we got to this point and the role politics plays in is beyond the scope of my talk, but thinking about what we as planetariums can do is not. I don't know if, uh, to what extent the planetarium community, community has been actively involved in this problem, so pardon me if I come across as uninformed. Clearly, the loss of trust in science is an enormous problem we'd all agree to, possibly earth-shattering, literally, with many and hard to pinpoint
causes. Admittedly, planetariums are a small part of the science field, but because we are, are a significant contact with the public, it seems worth our effort to do something. One idea to consider, in my, my view, is to be more open about how we know what we know in our presentations and in interactions with visitors. Most visitors think that what they hear or see from us is hard fact, unless we are careful to indicate otherwise. This, of course, is due to the lack of general pu public's understanding of how science works. I, like most of you, have been hanging out in this science shell since college, if not before. Empirical truth is second nature to us. Incidentally, I prefer to call it contingent truth. I think the term is years easier for our non-science folks to understand and immediately says something about the process involved. I am amazed at how many well-educated people do not get how science works. We have to be more deliberate in our interactions and our programming, is my thought. It's a difficult balance between engaging and overwhelming our audiences. I think, personally, an entire planetary show, planetarium show could be devoted to how we know, with well-chosen examples to illustrate the scientific, empirical, contingent approach. I was once invited to give a talk to an adult inquiry group. I was asked to talk about some of the astronomy topics recently in the news and explain about how we know. I chose Big Bang, Dark Matter, Dark Energy, and a few other hot topics. Preparing for the presentation was a chore, to be sure, but valuable. It let me update my own knowledge, as well as work to construct simpler explanations. It was an informative experience for me and one that made me wonder why we don't do more of that. I'll pass that question on to you. OK, enough trying to solve the world's problems. Time to end up on a more positive, personal note. I have realized or thought about recently what a great job you or have you, excuse me, realized or thought about recently what a great job you have? Sure, there's the usual day-to-day -day issues, long hours, inadequate budgets, middle school classes from Dante's Inferno. <laughs> <laughs> a person who, who's purchased a star and wants you to show them where to find it. <laughs> But think about it, how many people get to say every day they work with the universe? We get, a, um, we get to mix education, science, and art, and play with gadgets. These days, the gadgets are mostly digital, but still gadgets. When I was starting out in this field, I used to declare, everyone is interested in astronomy. You just have to find what part tickles their fancy. And I still believe it. I was once at a planetarium conference, I can't remember uh, which one, where Carl Sagan was invited speaker. Maybe some of you could remind me. He gave a public talk to which we were in also invited. Uh, after the speech, a dozen or so planetarium people cornered him to ask questions. I don't remember the question that, re that prompted the response, but my hero, Carl, said children should not be taught the constellations. They should be introduced to, in what, uh, in what I took to be astrophysics from his description, but at a level, of course, that they could understand. I was floored. To me, one of the great attributes of astronomy is that it embraces so many topics. A simple definition of astronomy is study of stars, planets, space, we kind of go along with that. But we all 
No, it embodies so much more. Certainly there's Carl's astrophysics, pretty much all branches of physics actually, as well as chemistry, biology, mathematics, optics, science exploration, science travel, space travel, timekeeping, navigation. There's history, cultural ideas. That's where I'd put the constellations, incidentally. Literature, music, art, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, immediately comes to my mind. You can fill in some more. There's something for everyone, I say. To me, contemplating the many topics of astronomy is both exhilarating and humbling. And for you, too, I'm sure. What's even more important, I think, though, is that our planetarium visitors share that same exhilarating, humbling response. You've seen it yourselves, I'm sure, in their faces and reactions and the questions that they ask. It's what Carl Sagan called the cosmic perspective, you might remember. I suggest the term, li the, the term living among the stars. To me, that phrase evokes a more personal experience. Why should we be, be concerned that our patrons understand that they are living among the stars? I think it's absolutely imperative to the human experience to have that viewpoint. Particularly now, the way this country and world finds itself with altern alternative facts, distrust of science, and extreme polarization akin to tribal warfare, this sense of humility that is gained by coming face to face with the enormous enormity of the universe and understanding that each one of us is connected to it and to each other is a strong antidote. We have the ability, allow me to say, the responsibility to promote, to promote that sensitivity whenever and wherever possible. Imagine what the country might be like if every representative and senator, or even just the majority of Congress, had that connection of living among the stars. Living among the stars. What I'm saying is, yes, our work is interesting, it's also important. I think you should consider, it should be considered vital to the future of humankind. I bid you continue to go the good work among the stars. Thank you. We've got hospitality, and it's right here, so you'd have to go 10 feet, hooray. Uh, um, so thank you very much, Dave, uh, for that. Um, and thank you for leaving behind such a wonderful facility for us to continue that work. Um, I feel very lucky to um, be your successor, so thank you. Um, I am also going to present to you here uh, this lovely certificate to honor uh, the your um, Spitz lecture. So I'm going to read this. Um, this is presented to Dave Batch, 2018 Armand N. Spitz Memorial Lecturer in recognition of your dedicated service and contributions to the planetarium profession and science education, given with grateful appreciation by the Great Lakes Planetarium Association. So thank you very much. Thank you.